Oh my goodness. Becky, look at her Bible. It is so huge. She looks like one of those preacher guy's girlfriend. But who understands those preacher guys anyway? They only talk to her because she looks like Mother Teresa. Okay. I mean, but look at it. It's just huge. It's gross. She just looks so... So this presentation is called King James Only History. So what we're going to be looking at today, the aims, we're going to be exploring the King James Only movement. We're going to be investigating how King James Bible has shaped religious, literary or literature and cultural aspects of the American society. We're going to analyze King James I and other monarchs role in colonization in America and its significance in American history. We're also going to explore the potential Masonic influence on King James I and the King James Bible. We're going to investigate historical theories regarding connections between King James I and Freemasonry. We're going to examine the role of Freemasonry in early modern Europe and the Bible for governmental control. We're also going to evaluate evidences and arguments regarding Masonic influences on King James I and the King James Bible. In the American space especially, it's been programmed into many people from early. Uh, King James only, King James only, King James only. Why, 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 what's all that about? Why is there such a, a, a program? People have probably heard it from infancy to adulthood. And it's interesting, there's only, as I, I put on the community wall, does, what can you close? Can you close your mouth? Yes. Can you close your eyes? Yes. And you've probably closed some other places too. But it's difficult to close your ears. So if you've heard the same thing time and time again, sometimes it just becomes normal. It becomes normalised, it goes into the subconscious, it just becomes something that's just... You don't even think about because it's like the heartbeat. It's like you don't think to breathe, you just breathe. There's certain things we just breathe. But is there any credibility or what is the origins behind the things that we just breathe? You understand? So we're going to be looking at these things. We're not going to shy away from these things. We're going to go all in. I like big bubbles and I cannot lie. You Christian brothers can't deny that when a girl walks in with a KJV and a bookmark in Proverbs, you get stoked. Got a name engraved so you know this girl is saved. It looks like one of those large ones with plenty of space in the margins. Oh, baby. I want to read with you Cause your Bible's got pictures My minister try to console me But that book you got makes me so holy King James And King James only History We're looking at the King James only History So King James only belief Often associated with certain segments Of American Christianity And now Hebrewanity That holds the King James version Or the KJV 1611 of the Bible is the only legitimate or superior translations. People might not say it, but they'll have a weird, crazy affinity, affiliation to a particular document, a particular manual. So King James only, this belief is sometimes intertwined with American patriotism and evangelical fervor. Everybody, Robert Breaker here. I'm on my journey to Peru, about to leave and at the airport, as you can tell. But uh, I wanted to tell you about my hat. I got a nice hat here, KJV only hat. Um, my, many of you might remember on a live stream I did, I was wearing this hat. Well, I forgot to tell you where you could get one like this. I designed this hat myself. And uh, you can go to www.americanpatriotsapparel, an S on Patriots, American Patriots Apparel, and you can get this hat. And uh, it's a little costly and some people have said, why is that hat so expensive? Well, because I got the Bible verse on the back, Psalms 12, 6, 7. So if you're interested in that hat, I had a couple people email and say that, Brother Breaker, where'd you get that King James only hat? I want one of those. Well, that's where you go to get it. American Patriot Apparels, American Patriots Apparel .com. So King James only movement. So what we're going to do at this little part of the presentation, we're actually going to look at modern history then we're going to go in our time machine and go all the way back to the past and then we're going to go all the way back to the present day so we're going to be going from past to prison past to prison this is the king james only movement section there's a guy called ruckman 
who was known for his position that the King James Version constituted the advanced revelation and was the final preserved word of God in the English language. This view is often called Rukmanism. By its opponents, his followers were called the Rukmanites. So, by his opponents, Rukmanism, but by his followers, they were called the Rukmanites. Now, it weren't just this particular individual who had a King James only uh, perspective, there was quite a few. Let's see a few other individuals. Now, before we get there, here's an interesting testimony of what happened to somebody. So, somebody was boarding the Agape boarding school in Missouri that endorsed the King James only position. One student said that when he arrived at the school, he was strip searched and his Bible was thrown in the trash. Why, you ask? Because it was not a King James version. Interesting. There you can see look at arc for the, the entrance of the gate for this particular building with a beautiful red cross. Was this amazing? Um, now, to stay on topic, King James only movement. So here you have a guy called Benjamin George Wilkinson, was a Seventh-day Adventist missionary, educator, theologian. He served also as a, de a dean of theology at the Seventh-day Adventist Washington Missionary College, known as the Washington Adventist University, which is located in Tacoma Park, Maryland, near Washington, D.C. Wilkinson is considered one of the originators of the King James only belief. But Chick was an independent Baptist who followed a dispensationalist view of the end times. He was a believer in the King James only movement, but every English translation of the Bible more recent than 1611 promotes heresy or immorality they may hem and haw about the original greek and the hebrew which nobody has or say i like so and so version but nail them down or at least try to what you'll find is they have no absolute authority so they'll accept almost any bible anything but the king james Fascinating stuff. Fascinating. Let's continue looking into the history of psychology and the pathways that people have adopted and don't even know the origins. Let's get into it a little bit more then. Let's find out more. Adherents of the King James only movement, mostly members of conservative Anabaptist, traditionalist, Anglo, Catholics, conservative, holiness, Methodists, and some Baptist churches, believe that King James needs no further improvements. Because it's the greatest English translation of the Bible which has ever published. And they also believe that all of the English translations of the Bible which were published after the King James are corrupt. Are you breaking up with me? Thou hast fairly spake. I don't understand. Like I literally don't understand the words that you're saying. Thy love is better than wine. And yet, trying to play me with the ESV. The ESV? It does not, only KJV. Trying to play me with the CSB. That's a good translation. Me thinks not, only KJV. Trying to play a the NASB. It does not need a KJB. I'm only KJV. Henceforth, read really? KJV. Or thwart hey. or plans to lay with me. I'm only KJV. I'm only KJV. But we have the exact right. same theology. I'm only KJV. But you just started reading the King James like a week ago. I'm only KJV. No time for my next chick to wet this. She was not my text is receptus. Thou art fair, hast thou size and pleasant. But methinks thou dost much protest it. Okay, okay, baby. I have a solution. Why don't we just read the new King James Version? Go thy way, thy hair's a flock of goats, yet go thy way. Meseems thou shouldest go thy way. Go thy way, thy hair's a flock of goats, yet go thy way. Okay, fine. But you still think I'm saved, though, right? Me thinks not. Only KJV. Oh. I think you're in a cult. I'm only KJV. I'm only KJV. King James Only Movement. Gail Ann Rippinglinger, a Jewish Messianic, born the 10th, 1947, is an American writer and speaker for her advocacy of the King James Only movement. 
and denunciation of modern English Bible translations. God has not called readers to check his holy Bible for errors. In awe of thy word, Gail Ann Ripplinger. So we're going to put a video in, and then we're actually going to get to the history, we're going to look at King James, we're going to look at colonialism, we're going to look at the fascination behind certain dates like 1619, 2019, all these just beautiful laid out dates of times and just perfectly put in the public domain to help us understand our reality. And so I want to make it clear to everyone that the New King James tends to the liberal on that. The other thing that the New King James does is it omits hell probably about 30 times. Now, if he's omits hell probably about 30 times. Now, but the New King James has changed that to Hades, okay? And if you said to him, but the New King James has changed that to Hades. A connection to the founding pilgrims and Freemasonry. Some early American settlers, including the pilgrims, did use the King James Version of the Bible. Additionally, Freemasonry has historical ties to various religious and philosophical movements. And some Freemasons often hold the King James only belief. Looking at King James, it was moreover during the reign of King James that the pilgrim movement within the Reformed churches separated from the Church of England and began their colonizing venture in America, known as the Plymouth Colony in 1620, under the leadership of William Bradford and William Brewster. Now, what's fascinating, you have this whole colonialism regime, which started, kind of started before King James, but at the same said time, it was contemporaneous to King James. And we're going to get into all of these different monarchs who had a hand or a hidden hand in colonialism and these histories that we've been given. But I digress. So it was moreover during the reign of King James that the pilgrim movement within the Reformed Church is separated from the Church of England and began colonizing uh, the colonized inventor in the Americas, known as the Plymouth Colony, under the leadership of William Bradford and William Brewster. So when you go to the Plymouth Colony, uh, you have a place called Providence, because it was by God's divine providence that they had this providence and was able to start their utopia after, you know, killing people, barbering people. But that's beside the point, Christianity. So you have Providence, and it just so happens on your dollar bill, you have the eye of Providence, which is to show in God we trust. So it's fascinating. Now, going to the first president of America. So, Washington believed the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. Amen. And more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. Amen. So, the Eye of Providence, a journey into Masonic symbolism. The Eye of Providence is a symbol recognized by Freemasons everywhere as a beautiful representation of the watchful care of the Supreme Architect. So what did Washington believe, the first president of America, that the hand of Providence and you know, you must be an infidel if you lack this kind of faith and you don't have this kind of gratitude. Fascinating stuff. All right, so let's continue a little bit more. So I know people say, oh, but that's not Washington, he was black. So I'm going to help people with black and white Washingtons, make people feel at home. So here's black Washington. So black Washington, brown Washington, Providence has at all times been my only dependence for all other resources seem to have failed us. Amen. The Eye of Providence is a symbol recognized by Freemasons everywhere as a beautiful representation of the watchful care of the Supreme Architect. Cool. Oh. So there's Washington. There you have the black version for the that side. And, you know, I, I, we have the white one too. Everyone feels happy. Okay, cool. Now, he also said, which is 
quite fascinating. Religion is as necessary to reason as reason is to religion. And again, religion is as necessary to reason as reason is to religion. The one cannot exist without the other. What? The one cannot exist without the other. A reasoning being would lose his reason in attempting to account for the great phenomena of nature, had he not a supreme being to refer to. And, well, has it been said that if there had been no God, mankind would have been obliged to imagine one fascinating stuff. So there's the first president of America, and he's talking about religion is essential to governing people. Without religion, people will cry for a religion because people are always going to ask, why are we here? Where do we go from here? What's the point of being here? Is there more to life than meets the eye? Are we just a blob of cells by happenstance? So they already know that in the psychology of people, they need a religion. They need a belief system. They need something to help with these answers, with these questions. Interesting. Let's continue. Let's advance. So when you start looking into uncharted territory of the slavery and religion. So this is a Ghana and this is a, a dungeon or the cells and these are places that people were held before being taken into um, slavery and it was, wasn't just this place in Ghana, there was places all across West Africa and then before we had the transatlantic you had the trans-Saharan which was East Africa and then to be fair contemporaneously to the slave trade of West Africa you also had the Barbary slave trade too which is where Europeans were being marketed in Morocco and it said that their flesh was cheaper than a cloth. So there was a lot of slaveries going on, but depending on certain things is the view and the perception that will get beaten into your cranium and also affiliation and affinity. Now, what's interesting is that this is the Bible. This is not, no, this is the Bible. This is the King James 1611 Bible. We looked at this the other day. And it just seems to have interesting symbolism all throughout it, like all throughout it, um, which is, quite fascinating and again you can see similarities and when you go to the west coast of Africa, Ghana you can see these same symbols skull and bones, skull and bones in this King James version of the Bible so it just gets a bit interesting why? what's going on? but we're going to see certain things as we go through I assure you Mama Mia, you say you want Koinonia? Well bless me, bless me and teach me about John Wesley I saw her praying while I was DJing. She got grace, pretty face. She ain't going down to the bad place. I'm tired of heathen guys saying they like pocket size. Ask the average Christian to take a look. She gotta pack much book. So, fellas, yeah, fellas, yeah. Have your girlfriend's got the book. Oh, yeah. Well, read it, read it, read it, read it, read that holy book. George Washington, the first president of the United States, owned several. Bibles throughout his life. One of the most well known is the George Washington inaugural Bible, which he used for his inauguration ceremony on the on April the 30th, 1789. The Bible is a King James Version printed in London in 1767 by Robert Atkin. It is known for its ornate cover and was borrowed from the St. John's Lodge number one. The ancient York Masons in New York City for the inauguration ceremony. Fascinating stuff. Amen. So, the plot thickens. A lot of these so called African con countries were in bed with this whole system. This is why I think the whole system and the, and the history and the, re, the explanations and explaining of history is very interesting. I, I think there's been a lot of um, scandals in the name of his story and the surf economy get given some distorted, disfigured his story. Let's continue a little bit more regarding this document, this manual. So here is uh, the King James Bible that George Washington swore on and it was during his inauguration in the Federal Hall in 1789. The Bible is owned by the St. Lodge No. 1 and is on loan to the National Park Service. So if you want to see that Bible, there you go. And remember, I told you the Bibles were never supposed to be portable. 
They were supposed to be for communal use. And there's only certain people who was ordained or officiated into the brotherhood of Jesus that were able to read to the commoner to give him common prayer and a common understanding of his life and circumstances. So here is the Bible um, that King, not King James, uh, George Washington used, which is the uh, King James Bible. All right, so let's move forward a little bit more regarding that. So this is Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, she believed what? She said, that book or that manual or that Biblios or that Bible, bibliography, accounts for the supremacy of England. The supremacy of America? No, America was colonized by Britain. The supremacy of India? No, India was colonized by Britain. But when it came, came to Britain, this book has helped immensely um, in the supremacy of England. But is she the only one who said that? Was she having a... What, what was going on in her head for her to say that? Why was this document from one head of state given to other heads of state and they would bow in recognition when, given, when handled or given this manual? Seems interesting. Let's find out what her cousin had to say as well regarding the supremacy of England. So King James believed what? The state of monarchy is the supremacist thing upon earth. Again, the state of monarchy is the supremacist thing upon earth. One more time. The state of monarchy is the supremacist thing upon earth. Why? For kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth, okay, and sit upon God's throne, okay, but even by God himself, they are called gods. Oh, interesting. So King James believed that a monarch is God. In the scriptures it says, ye are gods, and we broke down what all that means in the confines of law, civil law, canon law. We looked at all of that. There's a presentation on that. You know when I said you can be in a room and someone speak in English, but if they're using certain lexicon jargon and you don't understand what they're saying, they can be speaking over you, under you, around you, and you think you're all believing the same thing of one accord, but you have one accord and they have another accord. You think when you're saying God, it means someone in the cloud, but they know that you're referring to them as the God on earth. It's interesting, but let's just move on, not ruffle any feathers too much. But let's continue. So he thought that he was God. And this is a general thing with rulers in empires and, and, and civilizations. And this is, we're going to go somewhere later, like another, another presentation. All right, so he believed that. And his cousin, well, not his cousin, uh, his relative believed that too. So Queen Victoria believed that. And King James also believed that. All right, so what did his um, cousin belief. So we've looked at Victoria, we looked at man like James. Let's see what his cousin had to say, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth believed he that will forget God will also forget his benefactors. He that will forget God will also forget his benefactors and incidentally she had her own bible too it's called the bishop's bible and on the bishop's bible she is above the word because she is god and you have your two pillars of providence sovereignty it's all just in there in cold within the images but essentially what they're saying is the monarchs are god and the monarchs have lords and we need that's another conversation so anyway there she is he that will forget god will also forget his many factors okie dokie remember the commoner weren't supposed to get all of this he was too busy working he goes and he can't close his you can close his eyes you can close his mouth but he can't close his ears and all the time he's getting fed the word of god now check this 
Kings are justly called gods. This is what King James believed. For that they exercise a manner or resemblance of divine power upon earth. So Elizabeth I and King James were first cousins once removed, sharing a common ancestor, Margaret of Tudor. So they had this, this, this world view, this world outlook of the Bible being a supremacist document. And this is what went to all the heads of states that came into a covenant relationship with these gods or monarchs. But let's hold fire, let's advance. Elizabeth believed, believed, sorry, this realm of England is an empire governed by one supreme head and king having the dignity and royal estate of the imperial crown of the same. This realm of England is an empire governed by one supreme head and king having the dignity and royal estate of the imperial crown of the same. Again, such jargon I mean, the day they were saying these things would go over the common man's head. He's thinking, I don't even know what they're thinking. Understood. All right, let's continue. Let's advance a little bit. So she also said, I thank God I am endued with such qualities that if I were turned out of the realm in my petticoat, that means in her underdress, I were able to live in any place in Christendom. She's just saying, if I even got kicked out of England, in my petticoat, that means a uh, undercoat or indecently dressed. She knows she can find anywhere to live in Christendom. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's some powerful stuff. I don't go anywhere. I've got that passport that allows me to go wherever I choose to. And most citizens of the crown are able to go to any country they choose to and are afforded inalienable and certain rights because they're under the Queen or the King of England. British passport seems to open doors. And she's saying, I can go anywhere in the empire. I'm English. <laughs> what do you mean? I can go out in my petticoat, bro. <laughs> wow. Anyway, there are benefits of being a part of so-called empire. All right, so let's continue though. So in 1563, you have Jesus of Lubick was chartered to a group of merchants by Queen Elizabeth I, becoming involved in the Atlantic slave trade and smuggling under John Hawkins, who organized four slave voyages to West Africa and the West Indies between 1562 and 1568. So in terms of this vessel, this vehicle, Elizabeth, becoming involved in the Atlantic during the last voyage. And this was a vessel that I believe was German in origin, but then it was taken over by the Brits. And allegedly, apparently, allegedly, apparently, they used to say, Jesus saves, which is interesting. So Queen Elizabeth and King James of Scotland, who later became King James of England, ruled during overlapping periods, or they did not rule at the same time. So they ruled overlappingly, but they didn't rule England at the same time. So while one was ruling Scotland, one was ruling England, then when the one died in England, the one from Scotland took over the slot that was available in England, just in case you're not aware of the time in between these uh, monarchs. So Queen Elizabeth I reigned as the Queen of England from 1558 until her death in 1603. King James of Scotland, on the other hand, ascended to the Scottish throne in 1567 and ruled until 1625. However, their reigns did not intersect in any significant way. When Queen Elizabeth died in 1603 without her heir, James of Scotland succeeded her as James I of England, thus becoming the first monarch to rule over both England and Scotland. This event is known as the Union of Crowns as it united the English and Scottish crowns under one monarch, which is the same principle that you see in ancient Egypt, the two crown system. But you see that all these systems, are that they, they transcend the culture, a book, a location, all this kind of stuff where people try to standardise and like copyright 
spirituality. But I'm moving too fast. So we've looked at all this stuff then. So what did they believe? They believed that they were essentially gods. If you're on the throne of England, you're a god. You are God. You're not just serving a God, but you are the manifestation of God. We saw the involvement of Elizabeth at the start of this slavery escapade into West Africa, 1562-1568. So then when you go to slavery now, and we're looking at these symbols, and we look at the King James uh, Version of the Bible, it, it, it is a bit fascinating. That apparently, there was a website and it was selling the Masonic referral Bible used by the founders of our Freemasonry in 1630. What's also fascinating is that when you look at some of these uh, slavery shackles, embedded into some of these shackles is Masonic symbolism. So, so fascinating is the church is pretty much in Africa. It doesn't really have the same power as it used to. It does have power in England, but it's not really like, um, for want of a better word, if, if someone, an archbishop said something in England, it wouldn't really hold that much weight because no one really values the church system in that sense. But when you go to places like Africa, Nigeria and Kenya and stuff like that it's like the church plays an integral role in society when it comes to politics and it's always been that template that you see in Africa of a church controlling the consciousness or the voting direction of their devotees in which or who they should appoint to be elected you see it more in its raw form on the continent and in England it's quote-unquote more refined but it's just interesting the involvement of the church in many um, endeavors Going back to this then, Jamestown, Virginia is historically significant for its role in the establishment of American slavery, Jamestown. In 1619, the arrival of the first Africans to the colony is often cited as the beginning of chattel slavery in what become the United States. It wasn't even the United States at this time, by the way. Did you know that actually Morocco was one of the first countries to recognize the newly independent United States? opening its ports to American ships by decree of Sultan Mohammed in 1777. Interesting. Um, these Africans were brought to Jamestown as indentured servants, but over time the system evolved into one of hereditary lifelong enslavement based on race. Now this is a book called The Negro and Indians Advocate. Suing for the administration into the church or persuasive to instructing and baptizing of the Negro and Indians in our plantations. <laughs> so is a, is a book man, a persuasive to instructing and baptizing of the Negroes and Indians in our plantations. You understand? How would you get people not to run from a plantation? You put the fear of God into that guy. You leave this plantation. You better slave, slave on, obey your master. The Bible says slave on. The, 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 the people that, hey, listen. Hey. Okay. So we have all these dates. We have these dates going back to Jamestown, King James. We have all this history that's a bit mm, delivered in a certain way. But okay. That compliance therewith can produce no man's just interest, so without neglecting and opposing of it is, is no less than a manifest apostasy from the Christian faith. By Morgan Gooden. System of how to baptize Negroes and Indians into plantations which is the same feudal system that was in Europe. All they did was change the feudal system of the church being God, 
the landlord, the barons, the, like this, the whole system, but repackaged in the American colony, which was under the British. You, you can see very much patterns of connectivity and similarity between these things. The peasants and the serfs were not taught the word of God. They weren't taught the Latin. They were taught makeshift languages. The people, the priests would talk over them and the people would say, Amen. Yeah. And they would be encouraged to work and pay their tithe, which is soft tax. And that soft tax went back to the monarchy and the monarchy kept the state happy. The state kept the monarchy happy. That's in England. Now you look at it from the plantocracy, it's the same system. This is why they gave, they wanted church on the plantation. They didn't outlaw church. They micromanaged this thing called church, but they didn't outlaw this thing called church per se, because it's good business. And also, what did Washington say? People need a belief system. Interesting. But let's continue a little bit more though. A lot of people talk about Black Boy or King Charles II. So King Charles II is a grandson of King James I. Now a lot of people argue, King James was black, King James was this. Well, I've always said and always stated, King James wasn't quote unquote black because there's no such thing as quote unquote black. Yes, a lot of the royals were mixed with North Africans, which would be Mauritanians, Moroccans, all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of that going on. A lot of it. Like today. To say black, are we saying sub-Saharan? Are we saying North African? Are we saying East African? Are we saying West African? Now, if you're West African centric, everything's West. East African, everything's East. Central African, everything's Central. North African, everyone fights for their own particular interest. I have no bone in the fight. I just want the truth and the truth will set you free. I don't care if it offends him, her or them. Back to this. So King Charles, admittedly known as Black Boy, um, reign saw significant developments in the institution of slavery, particularly in the English colonies. While the transatlantic slave had been established prior to his reign, it expanded during his time as king. In 1660, Charles II granted a charter to the company the Royal Adventures Trading to Africa, which effectively gave them a monopoly on the English slave trade. Additionally, in 1672, Charles II granted a new charter to the Royal African Company, or the RAC. Which, interestingly, I don't know if there's any connection to this, but in England, one of the top insurance companies is known as the RAC. Or, not one of the top, but there is a company in England called RAC. Quite reputable. I think it's a driving insurance company. I digress. Which further solidified England's involvement in the slave trade. So these monarchs that people want on these pedals were King James! Yeah, he was part of the slave trade thing. Interestingly, these people, these adherents of the slave trade, they ramble on about this King James, who was a set, effectively a part of the plantocracy. So, George Washington believed. What did George Washington believe? So I gave you back the black one, or you can have the white one, whatever rocks you want. So, he says, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Now, when you take into account what everybody has said, or the monarchs, and then this is the first president, and the, the, the village of Washington is in England to this day. Where Washington came from, there's a village called Washington to this day. So he wasn't American. He was the American president, but he was from England. <laughs> you understand? So it's, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. That's a very interesting statement. It is, the, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly implore his protection and favour. 
What is benefits? Did we just see that word benefits before? I'm sure we did. Where did we see that? He that will forget God will also forget his benefactors, Elizabeth I. Who had her own Bible, the Bishop's Bible, which, you know, has her on the front cover. In the place of providence between two pillars over the document or the manual. It's a duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of the Almighty God. Isn't America an, a, a, a Christian nation or a God nation? Could if the Queen was kicked out in a in her underwear, couldn't she find safety in one of her in one of her colonies, America? You know, a lot of people think they have this independence thing because they have an Independence Day where they change the flag, but it's the same system, the same brotherhood system. Whether it's on Africa, we got our independence. Jamaica, we got our independence. America, you think England's very sophisticated, you know? England's a very sophisticated place. In terms of the way they colonized the world. They colonized the world with, with, with flatteries and with, with forming treaties and breaking treaties and all these kind of stuff like wordsmiths. That's how you have William Shake. Hey. But let's continue. So here you have a Masonic document from darkness to light. You have the moon, you have the sun. We looked at all these symbols yesterday. Then you have God or the all-seeing eye or the eye of providence. Then you have the two pillars. Uh, then under the pillar, you have a pyramid. Then no, under the eye, you have the pyramid. Then under the pyramid, you have the Bible. And on top of the Bible, you have a compass. Then under the Bible and under the compass, you have the altar. Then, under the floorboards, the black and white checker floorboards, you have two people shaking hands. I'll do it here, actually, you can see, I forgot I could move. So there you go, boom. You have pyramid and Bible and compass. You have this all and eye thing there, and then God. Then you have moon and so on. Salaman, interesting. And you have these two pillars. Fascinating. Then you have the King James Bible. God. Bible, Bible. Moon, sun, or sun, moon, handshake. You just see the same iconography. The only difference is this is Masonic and this is the Holy Bible of 1611. You think if the monarchs said that they were gods, people would like listen to them. But if they say, believe in God, believe in God, but indirectly the same, believe in me, believe in me, whatever I decree is from God, yeah, it wouldn't really go down that well. Maybe the commoners, the peasants might put two and two together. But when you talk in circles, it goes over the head, under the head, round the head. They don't know what's going on. Also, when you have things in Latin and you Latinize things and you make things more top secret. So back in the day to encrypt a file, it was Latin. Not everybody could encrypt that because they didn't speak Latin. So they had a monopoly on the tongue of the common people. And we're going to see that as we go through. All right. So that's that. Then when you look at how the system was run, you had the church, you had the king or the monarch or the queen, you had the nobles, the barons, you had the knights, you had the freemen. The lowest class of the feudal system was also the largest. The serfs, by far, made up the bulk of the people during the Middle Ages. They were not slaves, but they were tied to the land they farmed and owned and owed the Lord. So they worked on the land and they owed the landlord. They weren't slaves, but technically they were on an open plantation. This was medieval England, an open plantation. If you weren't a lord, there was things you couldn't afford. If you was a lord, you are doing well on the monopoly board. Possessed in their loyalty, so they were possessed, they were the property of the lord. Do you know what lord means? Lord means a controller. A lord means a controller. They controlled them, like property. They could not marry without permission from their lord and lived very hard, restricted lives, often hardly growing enough food to survive from one year to the next. This is when the church started doing harvesting, bringing a harvest into the church to help feed the peasants. Using the same money from the tithing system. You know, it's an elaborate system when you zoom out and see how the things all connected. But aside from that, let's continue. So, what did King James believe? So, King James believed the state of the monarch is the supremest thing upon earth. For kings are not only kings, lieutenants upon earth, and sit upon God's throne. 
but even by God himself they are called gods. So King James held a strong conviction on the divine right of kings and even wrote a book on the subject. To that end, he continued to suppress many of the important aspects of the Puritan movement, including the many Puritan Congregationalists and Presbyterian views of church government. So during his time, he had an issue with this kind of breakaway. So what happened was you had King Henry had a breakaway from Catholicism. Then during or leading up to this time, he had breakaways from that breakaway. And there's all these different breakaways from the first breakaway and everything's just chipping off. And there's all these subsidiaries or daughter companies from the first company that was ruling everyone. Now you got all these breakaway systems. And he wasn't too popular with the Puritans and the Presbyterians. But eventually he managed to get everybody on board and get everybody to get on board by being a part of translating certain documents. That's interesting. So anyway, so we've seen how the kings had a lot of authority, a lot of autonomy, and obviously the president followed that same rule of thumb, and he also had a lot of um, autonomy and authority. And if you look at where he's pointing, he's pointing at the Bible, and the Bible is on a pillar, which is interesting. Now, going to this one, we've looked at how he thought that the monarchs were gods on earth. Now, 397 years later, this is the state of affairs in beloved England. Have the gods fallen? God forbid that our lords would fall so low. Amen. So 397 years later, it's like the, 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 the structure of the gods is starting to crumble. Not my king, not my king. You imagine all them people with that 300 years ago would have their heads chopped off in England. They would have been executed on the spot. I mean, if you have a king who can have a woman, a wife, and chop off her head so he can sleep with another woman or so that he can marry another woman because she became ugly or she wasn't appealing or attractive anymore or because she failed to produce for him a son, a heir to the throne, and you could just do that to a woman that you share a bed with. You think that could run back in medieval England? Medieval England, there was some serious stuff that happened. Rights were restricted. It was a very harsh environment. This template was perfected in medieval Europe. Then it was transpla transplanted onto the plantations of America. Not just America though, because Britain colonized a lot of places. It was also transplanted into India. It was also transplanted into other regions in Africa, Nigeria. It was transplanted wherever the crown went or the gods. And they made sure that whoever was under them was subject to the authority of God and respected her laws and lords. Of the empire of Britannia. So it's very interesting how far the power has crumbled or has it? So top five Christian countries in Africa are Nigeria, the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa. Top five Christian states in the United States is Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Louisiana, Arkansas. Then the top five Christian cities in England, again, based on significance and concentration of Christian population, is Canterbury, which is home to the Canterbury Cathedral, the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury. York, historically significant for its medieval minister and Christian heritage. Durham, known for its historical cathedral and Christian traditions. Oxford, home to Oxford University, where a lot of Bibles are published and produced, with many colleges founded with Christian principles. Then London, what a diverse city it has numerous historic churches and Christian communities. But it's quite fascinating that it's York, which is a, a top contender, uh, Canterbury and Oxford. And it's interesting that a lot of South American countries are named after the Bible power stations of England, like, you know, Durham and County Durham and 
you know, they even have a place in America called the Bible Belt, which pertains to the self, where they're the most religious as it comes to the manual. Quite fascinating, the connections and the synergy. If there are 2.3 billion Christians or people following religions based on religious texts like the Bible, how many jobs and industries are solely attributed to this religious group? We saw maybe criticizing this. There's a lot of people might be saying, oh, devil, because there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of finances in this thing, not just in this thing, but in all these religious documentations. I mean, to have your sins forgiven, you have to do a hajj. To be forgiven so tourism to go to that place to walk around that place it's a big money making thing obviously if you want to feel where um, the crucifixion happened you go to a place called israel so called and you get to experience that experience if you want to get forgiveness you go to the ganges you can see the patterns of how religion works so the puritans petitioned king james now throughout 1603 the Puritan ministers, let me move off that screen because it's too small. So throughout 1603, the Puritan ministers collected signatures for a petition known as the Millenary Petition because it was signed by 1,000 Puritan ministers. The petition was careful not to challenge the royal supremacy in the Church of England. Hey and called for a number of church reforms to remove ceremonies perceived as popish. The petition argued that a preaching minister should be appointed to every parish instead of one who simply read the service from the book of common prayer. In opposition to Archbishop John Whitskiff's policy that the clergy must subscribe to the book of common prayer and their use of vestments the petition argued that ministers should only be required to subscribe to the 39 articles and the royal supremacy finally the petition called for the ending of the episcopacy and the setting up of the presbyterian system of church governance part of our daily bread now puritans petition god king james right because the Petitioning God, but God is King James. So the use of the so this is some of their objections to the monarchy, King James. Now they had to be careful how they petition King James because he's God and God can kill you, or God can extend your life and bless you. So they was being very careful in their language, language words, words are power. Have to know what they're saying and what they're not saying in their document. Now check this though. So the Puritans petitioned God, King James, the monarch. And he was, they was upset with the use of the sign of the cross in baptism, which Puritans saw as superstitious. The rite of confirmation, which Puritans criticised because it was not found in the Bible. The performance of baptism by midwives, which Puritans argued was based on superstitious belief that infants who died without being baptised could not go to heaven. So that was a money-making thing too. When people, unfortunately, their children die prematurely or, or just, you know, Things of that nature is a way to make money. Oh man, you know. So a lot of doctrines were built upon fear mongering, but perfect love casteth away fit. It. And this, it, it, they want you fearful, but then they say don't be fearful. They want you to have discernment, but then they don't want you to have discernment. They want you to, they want you to give, but they don't want to give. <laughs> you understand? It is like one rule for, and one rule for the, and this is how you rule. Um, so the performance. So the exchangings of rings during marriage ceremony, again, seen, seen as unscriptural and superstitious. The ceremonious bowing at the name of Jesus during worship. So every time you heard Jesus, buzzword, bow. Jesus, bow. Now the buzzword is, amen, amen. Imagine you can go to a place and Amanda says, amen. And then instinctively, like Pavlov's dog, you say, amen. Amen. <laughs> Yo, oh, that's power. I tell you, the church reminds me of communism. They had all things in common. Anyway, so in the exchanging of rings during the marriage ceremony. Oh, no, we read that already. The ceremonious bowing at the name of Jesus during worship. And this, when they used to do this bowing thing, they used to bring out the cross with Jesus on there. 
if you want a black one or a white one and people would bow the requirement that clergy were the surplus as it wasn't mentioned in the bible and the custom of clergy living in the church building so the surplus is what you see the gentleman wearing is that overall so they were contesting like why are you wearing all these these fancy garments like what what's going on like what is this now every moray povage with a church has a church brand the church name and all this kind of stuff they adorn themselves like this or they might not adorn themselves like this but they still have this church template because it's a money maker now check this though the custom of clergy living in the church building so imagine this this is where i find it interesting the parallelism so nowadays you have people robbing people every sabbath every sunday guilt tripping them pay your tithes malshadadek and malshadadek is jesus malshadadek is not jesus malshadadek what is malshadadek you know and essentially give me the money give me the money give me the money and then people oh i need to malshadadek whatever so all this brainwash thing goes on people don't know where they're coming or going every wind of hallucination and it's as if when you check this though, there was a custom that the clergy live in the church building. So they were exempt from paying taxes. They were exempt from paying rent. They were exempt from paying council tax. They were exempt from paying water bill. They were exempt from paying the electric. They had all their commodities paid for by the church. And, they, and the Puritans would say, hold up, go on with this. But well, maybe they didn't say, well, go on for them English, you know. But they were challenging certain perks, privileges and benefits. Now, fast forward to today. The top pastor, more elder, elect, leader, whatever you want to call him. They have the mansion. They have the this. They have the that. You see the same system. Repackaged, rebranded, remolded. So this is what was going on in medieval, medieval England. People were challenging the gods and petitioning the gods to say, yo, hold up. Uh, I'm not really happy with this system. I think people are getting overly exploited. So under, the, under James I of England and the Puritan movement, the Puritan movement coexisted with the conforming Church of England in what was generally an accepted form of Episcopal Protestant religion. Separatists who had never accepted King James settlement of religious affairs began migrating to New England colonies from the Netherlands as well as England. So because there wasn't really getting on politically, with the direction of the God, they decided to revolt against this God. Now, the reason this even happened in the first place is because the monarch of England was upset with the God of Rome and broke away from that system under King Henry VIII, you have the Church of England. Then consequently or subsequently, years later, you have new kings and new monarchs that want to enforce their rule in the realm, in the empire, and they're not getting taken seriously and they're having fallouts with the clergy and they're having fallouts with the politics of their day which was religion centric which you see the same template in africa but in europe now it's like the system has been more or less abandoned no one really if the archbishops has jumped people would say what but in africa and places in west africa especially and not even just west central congo all these places whatever the archbishop or the, or the pastor says people would drink poison People were eat grass, people were do all kinds of, eat rat and all kind of dumb stuff for the gods or for the ministers, for the lords, you know. Um, but it doesn't really have that same weight in Europe as it did before. Like if those people holding them placards saying, not my king, regarding King Charles, they'll be finished. Conversely, when you go to Africa, if you say certain things against the, 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 the number one pastor or the number one preacher or whatever, are you hurting the Lord's anointed? You know, and they put death decrees on you and all kinds of crazy stuff. So the experience of Africa and religion is like what was happening in medieval times. But now it's more relaxed in Europe to an extent. Now, going back to this then. So under James the England, you had the Puritan movement started coexisting with the conforming Church of England in what was generally an accepted form of Episcopal Protestant religion. And then you had separatists who had never been accepted by King James' settlement of religious affairs. And then they said, okay, we're, we're tired of the king. We want to go to this new colony in America and set up shop. Bigger on herd up, so 
I'm sitting here thinking, what if I find me a girl that shows midriff? You can have those bimbos. I keep those chicks that do devos. A word to the Christian sisters, I can't resist ya. I do God's time with ya, but I gotta be straight when I say I wanna pray till the break of day. Baby, got it going on like the wife in Proverbs 31. We just might get engaged when we finish reading this page, 'cause it's worn and it's torn, and I know that girl's I like big bubbles and I cannot lie. You Christian brothers can't deny that when a girl walks in with a KJV and a bookmark in Proverbs, you get stoked. Got a name engraved, so you know this girl is saved. It looks like one of those large ones with plenty of space in the margins. Oh baby, I wanna read with ya, 'cause your Bible's got pictures. My minister try to console me, but that book you got makes me so holy. Ooh, mama mia, you say you want coin or knee ya? Well, bless me, bless me, and teach me about John Wesley. I saw her praying. While I was DJ, she got grace, pretty face. She ain't going down to the bad place. I'm tired of heathen guys saying they like pocket size. As the average Christian, to take a look, she gotta pack much book. So fellas, yeah, fellas, yeah. Have your girlfriends got the book? Oh yeah. Well, read it, read it, read it, read it, read that holy book, baby. I'm NIV with the ribbon bookmark. NIV with the ribbon bookmark. Baby, got NIV with the ribbon bookmark. Ribbon bookmark. I like 'em leather and bound. It's 50 pounds. I just can't understand how it is some weenie wants Bible on CD. She wanna get you saved. Amen. Double up. Amen. I ain't talking about a paraphrase, 'cause Paul wouldn't use those anyways. I like 'em real thick and red lettered. You can't find nothing better. Southpaws in love. Bible's that big around, heard of. So I'm sitting here thinking, what if I find me a girl that shows midriff? You can have those bimbos. I keep those chicks that do devos. A word to the Christian sisters, I can't resist ya. I do God's time with ya, but I gotta be straight when I say I wanna pray till the break of day. Baby got it going on like the wife in Proverbs 31. We just might get engaged when we finish reading this page 'cause it's worn and it's torn, and I know that girl's reborn. So ladies, yeah. ladies, yeah. do you wanna save people from Hades? Yeah. Then read it till the pages fall out. Even white preachers gotta shout. Baby got time. Thompson chain with the big red letters. Today, Thompson chain with the big red letters. Baby got book. Yeah, baby. When it comes to a good book, Stephen King's resume just can't compare. 39 plus 27 equals 66 books, and if you're Catholic, there's even more. So your girlfriend quotes Bill Hybels, but does she got a big Bible? 'Cause that little thing she's got won't start a revival. My Bible study don't want none unless you got book, hun. You can read Clancy or Grisham, but please don't lose this book. Some brothers wanna play that hard role and tell you that book's too old, so they toss it and they burn it. But I pull up quick to just learn it. So your girl likes paperback. Well, I ain't down with that, 'cause my girlfriend's hot and her Bible's rockin', and she's got good doctrine. To the atheist chicks who try to diss, you ain't it, Miss Pris. Give me a Christian, I'm insistin', and I greet her with some holy kissin'. Some pervert tried to chase, but he didn't make it past first base. She's quick to resist temptation, and she loves a new translation. So, ladies who are lost and found, if you want the triple six thrown down, dial one eight hundred reads a lot and teach me about those Psalms, baby. Got NIV with the ribbon bookmark. And I'm in with the ribbon bookmark. Baby got Thompson chain with the big red letters. Thompson chain with the big red letters. <laughs> Bubble cows now, but you still got book. 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 Reign over England and various territories in France from 1189 to 1199. Most kings of most kings of old served in the military, and they had a hand in shaping the rites and initiations, military, masonry, and fraternity culture. So historically, let's look at some examples. In some ancient civilizations, such as ancient Greece. Aspects of military culture and homosexuality were intertwined. For example, the sacred band of Thebes, an elite military unit, 
composed of pairs of male lovers, is often cited as an example of this connection. Similarly, certain Roman military practices and institutions had aspects that intersected with same-sex relationships. So I, the people often say that when they went around colonizing the world, that they went around and they set up churches, but they also set up brotherhoods and the brotherhoods are tied to the church or maybe it's always been a church vehicle to begin with. Because history is written by the victors and history has definitely been written by the church and different types of churches. Quick summary then. King James colonization efforts. So King James played a significant role in promoting English colonization in America during the 17th century. He granted charters to several English companies, including the Virginia Company of London and the Plymouth Company, which led to the establishment of Jamestown in 1607 and the Plymouth Colony in 1620, respectively. King James' first support for colonization was driven by various factors, including the desire to expand England's overseas territories, increase trade opportunities, and assert English dominance or supremacy in the New World. His reign saw the beginning of the English settlement in America, laying the groundwork for further colonization efforts, and eventually establishment of the 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard. Why do we have this insane, insatiable desire to like over romanticize and fantasize about King James, whether he was a black or a white or a mulatto or a chicken or an egg. Why is it such like embedded into the psychology of American citizens especially? Well, we kind of seen the intricacies behind all of these similarities. And that's been a part of the, the culture. Other monarchs then, other monarchs such as Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I and King Charles II also played a significant role in England's colonization efforts in America. It's funny as well because the people give Christopher Columbus a hard time. Christopher Columbus Christ, you know. <laughs> then you have, what's his name? Serapis Christos. There was a lot of Christuses. There was a lot of these, these Christ titles, which is very interesting. I won't trigger too many people. But going back to this then, so other monarchs such as Queen Elizabeth I and King Charles II also played significant roles in English colonization efforts in America. Why I mentioned um, Christopher Columbus is that he is, um, for want of a better word, stigmatized, right? Christopher Columbus, yeah, rightfully so. Can't discover something that was already discovered. On the second hand though, people like celebrate King James as if he was like some anointed cherub. You understand? A lot of the things the gods did was for political reasons, to govern their citizens for government. You understand? Does the, 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 the peasant understand in this? Serve God and queen and country. Patriarch. Pa you know, very loyal to the flag, loyal to the crown, loyal to the colony, loyal to the plantocracy. Then you have those who say, hold up, what? The plantocracy, we're doing all the work, and the plantocracy has got the whip. Medieval England. You understand? So it's always been a class system that's just treated people unfairly based on how they perceive them in the world. But going back to this summary, so other monarchs such as Queen Elizabeth I, King Charles II also played significant roles in English colonization efforts in America. Queen Elizabeth I's reign saw the launch of several failed attempts at colonization, including the Ronaki colony, which disappeared in the late 16th century. King Charles II reigned reign witnessed the restoration of the English monarchy in 1660 and the subsequent expansion of English colonial territories in America, including the acquisition of New Netherlands, which was renamed New York. So if you didn't know, old news, New York used to be called New Amsterdam. King Charles is a grandson took that land back off the, the Dutch because you had all these monarchs in Europe fighting each other for supre su su uh, supremacy. You know, who could rule, who would be the number one god on earth. All these gods are fighting each other, all these kings and monarchs are fighting for supremacy of the new world. 
So like King James I, these monarchs contributed to the growth and development of English colonies in America, leaving a lasting imprint on American history and identity. Historical influence. The King James Version, the KJV, of the Bible was one of the earliest English translations and played a crucial role in shaping English-speaking Protestant Christianity. It was published in 1611 during the reign of King James I of England. As such, it, was a, it has a deep historical connection to the foundations of Christianity in the English-speaking world. The King James is celebrated for its poetic language and literary beauty. His translation sought to capture the majesty of the original Hebrew and Greek texts, resulting in a translation that has had a profound influence on the English literature and language. Many classic works of English literature, as well as speeches and writings by American figures such as Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr., have drawn upon the language of the King James Version. You can read Clancy or Grisham, but please don't lose this book. Some brothers want to play that hard role and take it that book's too old. So they toss it and they burn it, but I pull up quick to just learn it. So your girl likes paperback. Well, I ain't down with that, because my girlfriend's hot and her Bible's rockin' and she's got good doctrine. To the atheist chicks who try to diss, you ain't it, Miss Pris. Give me a Christian, I'm insistin', and I greet her with some holy kissin'. So King James only is primarily an American patriotic and evangelical slogan, popularized within Masonic circles, which is intriguing given the development of the USA and the church. However, it's important to recognize that it is not infallible and contains errors, as all manuscripts are human documents. George Washington and early American settlers, including the pilgrims, did use the King James Version of the Bible for oaths. Additionally, Freemasons has historically ties to various religious and philosophical movements, and most Freemason ministers often echo King James only. Are you breaking up with me? Thou hast fairly spake. I don't understand. Like, I literally don't understand the words that you're saying. Thy love is better than wine. And yet, trying to play me with the ESV. The ESV? It does not, only KJV. Trying to play me with the CSB. That's a good translation. Me thinks not, only KJV. You are not crazy, I like this meme. You are not crazy, you are awake in an insane world. For that exact reason, most people will call you crazy. We well, are introducing people to the concepts of how monarchs would rule their colonies and the tool that was used for colonization, it's gonna upset people because they're not ready to hear that. No, they're not. But when you look at it as just a document, a manual that's been revised over time, many a time for different political agendas for the procurement of resources and a plethora of other things, we'll start to connect a little or maybe not. He that will forget God, never forget the gods, will also forget his benefactors, or will also forget his benefits of being under the crown of God. Fascinating stuff where you start to just really realize what they, what they were saying and who they were talking to and who they were talking about in a lot of their publications. Enjoy your time, enjoy your evening, live life righteously and do right by your fellow human. Understood. All right then, people. Bless. Teach me about those songs, baby, got And I be with the ribbon bookmark. And I be with the ribbon bookmark. Baby, got books and chain with the big red letters. Thompson chain with the big red letters. Bubble cows now, but you still got book. 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 You gotta know the law, so you can really serve. You gotta know the cause. 
off the load of effects Don't just swing to the beat When it's out on the decks You gotta know that you're called to be an elect The world is a spell Don't understand that you're living in hell When you know the word, you speak and pronounce Walk as a god in the image of God with purpose in your mouth yeah. Call them decree cause the Lord's in the house yeah. But we don't understand what the law is about no. Priests and monarchs are a part of the play They yeah. lord it over you like every day yeah. I quit that stage, one impressed with the play I'm all about truth, don't care what they say Most plugged in you gon' plug them out Devoted devotees to the Waffle House Falling on the floor at the mouth If that's your God, I don't care <laughs> Yo, what is about? We're made in God's image I see Him every day Your body is a temple, don't throw it away And if you don't know the Lord, they don't care what you say They don't care if you're white or you're black or you're grey but when you know how the world works, how it works. Yo, you can clearly display, display. articulate what you say. Display. They can't stop you like a gay. Your words reverberate. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. 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 To the most high. And everyone's in the image of the most high So don't pass by them as you go by Remember to love your neighbours and know why Glory to the most high Where are you from? Maidenpool, my lord Well played, my lord Ham